Well, um, thank you. Thank you very much for having me here today. I'm honored with the award. Um, I'm especially honored to be here and um, with Julie in mind. Um, David, Todd, thank you for your background. It was really nice to hear more about Julie and, and Rose, I really appreciated that as well. Um, Sasha, thank you for your kind words. And Anna and the committee, thanks a lot. I really appreciate your work, obviously. Um, my topic today is toxic stress and its impact on our nation's school children. Um, before I get going and talk about this very important topic. I would like to acknowledge my partner in crime who, who left the room and came in just in time <laughs> for me to say thank you. Um, I've been doing a lot of work in this area with Dr. Melissa Holland and she was walking through just so that everybody could see her. We actually find it. <laughs> you did. So anyway, thank you all. Um, okay, let's begin first by talking about toxic stress um, and place it within the context of stress in general. Stress is something I'm sure that's near and dear to many of us. <laughs> it's something that we all deal with. And from the perspective of the developing child, I think it's really important we acknowledge that a certain amount of stress is important. It's essential to normal, healthy development. Children need to experience a certain amount of stress, especially when there are supportive, nurturing adults around them to help them regulate the stress mechanisms. Um, so a certain amount of stress we can call positive. Then there is the idea of tolerable stress. And up until relatively recently, that's been my focus. Um, tolerable stressors are those critical incidents or crises that have a relatively clear onset and termination, a car accident, um, most natural disasters. These aren't things we necessarily want our children to experience, but Arguably, to the extent they, they learn how to cope with it, um, that can yield something known as post-traumatic growth, where you learn to deal with really serious, profound, overwhelming stressors. And again, up until recent times, my work has been focused on how adults in particular can help children cope with these tolerable stressors, these acute one-off events. Well, my work in the area of tolerable stress led me to the construct of toxic stress also referred to as complex trauma. Toxic stress, unlike tolerable stress, or the acute stressful event, is chronic and ongoing. And tragically, as I've traveled around the country talking a lot about responding to acute traumatic stressors, educators have approached me and said, you know, Steve, this is really helpful, but. And what they were informing me of was the sad reality that a significant number of our nation's school children are in environments where the stress is chronic. It's ongoing. It doesn't end. I had an interesting opportunity last fall to sit on a panel for the Kennedy Forum um, at a National Mental Health Conference in Seattle, Washington. They brought in a young man from Chicago, from Chicago Public Schools, and he spoke about his travels on the subway where he left his neighborhood and went to the downtown area of Chicago that I know, and how he just all of a sudden relaxed. And it was remarkable for him as he left his neighborhood, which he hadn't done a whole lot of, and appreciated, I don't have to be looking over my shoulder anymore. Anyway, that's really what I want to talk to you briefly about here today, is the idea of toxic stress. But first, I want to put that within the context of mental health, because really what we're talking about when we have talk about children exposed to complex trauma or toxic stress. We're talking about a population that is at great risk, great risk for mental health challenges. And here it's important we realize that while up to one in five of our nation's school children has a mental illness, only about 20% of those kids get any treatment whatsoever, meaning, we can all do the math, right? 80% of our nation's school children are left untreated, those with, with mental health challenges. Of those who get some care though, 70 to 80% of them get them in a school setting. And not surprisingly given that fact, most children in this country get the care, the treatment they need to deal with severe debilitating mental illness because of an educator, 
because of someone working in a school. Um, it's not the psychiatrist, it's not even the specialty mental health clinic where most kids who get the help that they need get it. It's because of folks like us, educators, working in and supporting the work of schools that those few kids who do get help get it. Um, with that in mind, let's talk briefly about schools being a logical setting wherein to provide mental health care and treatment. Um, first, most of our kids attend a public school. Um, latest federal estimates is close to 90% of our nation's children are in a public school. Combine that with the fact that we know that when we place mental health care and treatment within a school setting, treatment compliance increases 21 times. So it's a very powerful place. Um, and also in that regard, we need to keep in mind that a full 50% of lifetime cases of mental illness will emerge during the school years. By age 14, half. That's during our watch, folks. That's during the time where we have children accessible, where we see them, where we're supposed to be helping them grow and learn. That's during our watch. Another important point to be considered before I get back to my points about toxic stress is that the school is equipped not just to address mental illness, but also to perform mental wellness. And my colleague, Dr. O'Malley, was just talking about it in her talk just a few minutes ago when she was talking about the importance of multi-tiered systems of support. Um, what we can do with all sorts of mental health challenges, including the challenge of toxic stress, is we can provide interventions, interventions at the universal, um, indicated, targeted levels. We can target those kids that really need intensive services, but we can also intervene system-wide <coughs> to, to assertively promote mental wellness. Okay, well let's get back to the main topic at hand here, toxic stress. This slide just speaks to the acute stressor. And what we have here is the cycle of the stress response. So an individual perceives a threat, chemicals are released in the body, it <coughs> prepares us to fight, freeze, or flee. Uh, typically what happens when it's an acute traumatic stressor and for a school child when there's loving, nurturing, caring adults around to support them, to help them get through it, the body returns to baseline and you're pretty much back to, to normal. For kiddos experiencing multiple traumatic events, children who, for example, are abused, or those children who are in those communities like Chicago or certain areas in, in our state, in Southern California, for example, where community violence is not a one-off event. Where community violence is an ongoing, everyday occurrence. For those kids, the chemicals, which by the way are important and adaptive and keep them alive, don't return to normal. They're constantly in a state of arousal. The need, this gets to the need for trauma-informed care. We need to help educators in our nation schools become better prepared to appreciate the impact of complex trauma and toxic stress. What I'm showing you here is just trauma exposure in the general population. About 43% of youth by the age of 18 will have a tr be exposed to something capable of generating mental illness like post-traumatic stress disorder. Interestingly enough, the default assumption here is recovery. Most kids cope. You can see the lifetime prevalence rate of PTSD is only about 8%. But look at these statistics down here. In certain urban populations, trauma exposure, trauma exposure is to rule, and you can see the rates of post-traumatic stress are very, very high. This slide just speaks to some of the neurochemical implications of complex trauma and toxic stress. Um, one of the more profound effects of complex trauma is its impact on the hippocampus. You all know what the hippocampus is responsible for? Memory. Memory. Yeah. Learning. Um, another main brain structure affected by toxic stress is the amygdala. Any guesses on that one? It becomes really activated 
when you're constantly and continually exposed to toxic stress. The amygdala is basically the fear center of the brain. So what we have here is a population of kids that are coming into school with hippocampal volumes that's reduced. They're not as able to learn and remember. And amygdalas that are constantly scanning the horizon for the next threat. The teacher comes up to them from behind, touches them on the shoulder, and what do you think they might do? If they're, good job, Rose. <laughs> they might do just that, exactly. Um, I have here a little bit, a little experiment we can all do. It speaks to the effects of complex trauma or toxic stress. Um, we're going to experience the experiment to, um, a mod in a modified way, but this was a study done a few years back with a group of children who have perhaps tragically given us the best understanding we have today of the impact of toxic stress, and those are kids who are, are abused. They come from homes where in some sort of abuse is commonplace. Um, for these kids, by the way, having an amygdala that is constantly scanning the horizon for the next threat, it's really adaptive and helpful. In, abu in, abuse in an abusive home. In a classroom, however, not so much. Anyway, let me run this experiment by you really quick. I'm going to show you four photos, OK? The study had a much longer series, but you'll get a sense for what this is all about. And I want to see if you can identify what the emotion is. Okay, so it'll show you, if you'll see a photo of a face for about a second, it'll go away, another face, it'll go away. And eventually, by the end, there'll be four photos. When you see the fourth photo, it'll be really clear what the emotion is. Okay, you ready? Okay, here's a little experiment. I don't want to be around this guy. <laughs> that, that, that guy is <coughs> not look, I don't, that's a scary thing. He's obviously really angry, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Get, yeah, you can see, I hope you can see where I'm headed with this. The abused children saw this much, much sooner than the control group who were not from abusive environments. Mm -hmm. So, and, and when they're at home, when they are in that abusive environment, the, the ability to predict that this is going to quickly evolve to this is adaptive. Mm -hmm. But in more normative environments like the classroom, not so good. It, it's very counterproductive. It gets them into trouble. It causes them all sorts of difficulties. Um, the need for trauma-informed care. Here I have a, a crime map. This is Los Angeles. Um, the time frame is July 1st, 2016 to December 21st, 2016. Can you see the little dots on the screen there? Um, each one of those dots represents a homicide. Just in that period, clustering in that particular group. Do you know what neighborhood we're looking at here? This is <coughs> Southern California, Compton. East LA. Compton, yeah, East LA, Compton, right in here. Um, where, by the way, there's currently a lawsuit underway wherein um, students are suing the school for failing to address the effects of toxic stress. Um, the effects of toxic stress have been shown to result in significant decreases in cognitive performance scores the week following a homicide that occurs in your neighborhood and it doesn't matter if you knew the victim or not. If it occurred in your neighborhood, and look at this, okay? This is, this is in about half a year. See where I'm headed with this? This has a very profound effect 
on the academic functioning of our nation's mm -hmm. school children. I think that this is a powerful explanation for the so-called achievement gap. And follow my reasoning, if you will. So we have toxic stress. And what I've been trying to do is to make the case that the physiological, psychological, and behavioral consequences of toxic stress will directly lead to poor learning and achievement. Reduce hippocampal volume, unavailable for learning. Okay, but you can also combine that with zero tolerance, zero tolerance policies to further exacerbate the situation. In other words, you've got kids who aren't available for learning. You have kids who are predisposed to interpret what may be normative behavioral interactions in a classroom as threatening or dangerous, and, and they respond accordingly. <clears throat> they get into fights. They can be removed from school, which further exacerbates the problem. What I think this need, needs to lead to, and this will be, um, I finally get a sabbatical, by the way. Did you know that? <laughs> it only took me 17 years, but yeah. And one of the things that I'll be doing this winter, spring, during my sabbatical is working a lot in this area of trauma-informed care. Um, I hope to help develop a curriculum designed to train educators on the effects of complex trauma, the effects of toxic stress, and also, and this is where my work with Dr. Holland has been really helpful, bring in, in a multi-tiered um, system of support, specific activities such as mindfulness and cognitive-based therapies, which, by the way, we know work. The bad news here is there are kids in our society who are the victims of toxic stress. The good news is we know what to do about it. And that's the end of my talk. Questions? Yeah. I'm trying to formulate this in my head so that it comes out coherently, so forgive me. I am not a victim of toxic stress. Um, so I think you presented some really compelling data, and I just want to push you a little bit and think about the reverse, sort of tying your presentation and Rose's together. So what if your stressors are actually a culturally hostile, you know, curriculum and environment in the classroom? And you've got stuff happening in school. I just wonder if you can speak a little bit about, because I think there's a there's an assumption that the classroom is a safe space, uh, and it may not really be a safe space, particularly for the population that you um, showed, you know, in that part of Los Angeles. So how do you sort of think ecologically about kind of, you know, how to reduce stress in, in all of the environments, but not assuming that one is more, that's sort of more toxic than the other for certain yeah, and, and I think consistent with the point you're making, and I appreciate that, and by the way, Rose and I have already talked about this, um, is one of, the, one of the, the points that I would like to get educators <coughs> to when they're dealing with a child who's experiencing or displaying some sort of behavior problem, instead of saying, what did you do? Get them to thinking, what happened to you? Um, because your point's very valid. Um, a lot of this just isn't the child's fault. Um, they have a history. They have an environment that has quite literally changed brain structure and function and predisposes them to poor learning outcomes and behavioral challenges and concerns. But I, I agree with what you're saying. And before we even talked, Rose and I, have you talked, thought about this? And yes, I have. My journey in this area is relatively new, um, so I would definitely welcome and I would appreciate any guidance you might have for me um, in this area. Julie? Um, uh, one is kind of, it's always very rare, maybe, I don't know, the most expertise. Just thinking about uh, when teachers don't have similar lived experiences to the students in those communities. Uh, how difficult it is to understand uh, the context in which the students are coming from. So that, from the separate piece, which is more in my uh, area, is <coughs> thinking about how to create a valid index to represent the toxic stress so 
where we can include this in modeling uh, for all different types of things. Specifically, uh, success programs, success in schools, success in teachers. So there's, there's so much um, unobserved variance in so many of our models. And I think <coughs> there's been this recent rash of studies saying that, for example, competition is to thank for the success of these particular schools, but it could be suffering from endogeneity because of missing variables like this. So I'm just wondering if you've thought about how you operationalize this construct and is something that is about and reliable in the future. Hmm. That's a good one. Do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> well, I just started thinking about it. That, so the challenge is getting the index to rep actually represent what the kids are experiencing, right? Mm -hmm. So whether it's certain amounts of certain types of things and how to and how to operationalize that and measure that into a number that goes up or down with that amount of toxic stress. <clears throat> I also think it, 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 it will be challenging to actually ask kids to say, because for some, for some kids this is normalcy, right? So they, they don't actually feel like they're experiencing these things, but if you were to ask them, do you experience this, do you experience this, do you experience this, how much of this do you experience, then you might be able to represent better than, say, self-report. Uh, just some things that yeah. I remember. Yeah, right now the, the diagnostic framework does not does not have, to my knowledge, Melissa, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it doesn't have that degree of specificity. You know, you could be, um, the, the, the most classic diagnostic indicator of traumatic stress as a psychopathology is post-traumatic stress disorder. And the literature speaks about the acute one-off traumatic stressor. Sometimes that can be so profound that can lead to psychopathology or complex trauma. Um, and it doesn't really click carefully operationalize that. Um, so yeah, that's a place that the that I think we do eventually need to go. But I think that that's beyond the scope of what I'm trying to do. I'm going to try to. Work, your first question I think is more in line with what I'm hoping to do. Part of the trauma informed care movement is getting people to understand not why did you do that getting people to understand what happened to an individual that led to certain behavior. And so your first point, that, that is definitely something that I would be looking towards doing, is helping the educator, the general education teacher, the special education teacher, to better understand the experience of a student. And, and in this regard, by the way, one thing I would like to mention, last June, Melissa and I did uh, a workshop, a full day workshop in Twin Rivers um, for local special educators and paraeducators. And it was probably, and it was our trauma-informed workshop. Melissa brought a lot of her cognitive behavioral techniques and mindfulness activities to this group of teachers and paraeducators. It was probably the best workshop we'd ever done because they were soaking it in. They they get it. So you know, I think they're. I'm kind of optimistic that with <coughs> the right message, with the right activities, with the right presentation, there's a lot of potential here to help our colleagues in the field better understand where kids are coming from. Okay. Um, I'm curious about the other end, the brain end, obviously, um, because there's been a lot of research in the last 15 years to point out that there's significant postnatal neural growth, new neurons generated in the hippocampus, but that it's linked with certain environmental things as well as hormonal sure. changes. And so I guess I'm just curious if you've done any reading on that, if these things might not just lower the toxic stress or the, the child's appraisal of events, you know, so that they don't go into the toxic stress, but also even creating context that help to and promote regeneration of neurons in the hippocampus? The answer to the question is yes. Awesome. Yeah. And it gets back to the point I was making when I wrapped up. We know what to do. Um, and yeah, it, um, actually Dr. Hall has been very helpful in that regard in terms of cueing me <coughs> into important research here. And isn't it as little as 20 minutes a day yes. of mindfulness-based activities? 27? Yeah. Oh, seven minutes off. Study. But yeah. Seven minutes a day can, uh, over an eight-week period, actually change brain structure in the hippocampus. 
hippocampal volume increases. And these are um, mindfulness-based activities, so um, guided imagery, breathing activities, which we can do on a universal basis. Um, and so again, that would be an important goal of my work during my sabbatical, is finding ways to explain to my colleagues and general educators you know, just the idea of complex trauma, toxic stress, and then I think the most important thing is these very doable, practical um, strategies that we can deploy at the universal level to, that, that, that can ameliorate the toxic effects of complex trauma. Yeah, I have a question. So what are some of the strategies that you could suggest for educators that have, that have students that have toxic stress but they're not exhibiting symptoms? Like, kind of like what the gentleman in the back said is that the stress is so normal mm -hmm. that maybe years or something down the line is finally something. Yeah, the, those, yeah I would, I would um, argue that they're not exhibiting mm -hmm. symptoms. It's just that this is their baseline. Right. You know, the, the kid experiencing an acute one-off toxic event, this is their stress level. And there's an acute trauma, and you see it. The kid w who's experiencing complex trauma, it's always up high. It's always there. Um, for kids with really significant challenges, um, we need what we would refer to as a tier three or indicated intervention. And that would be one-on-one -on -one work with a school psychologist, school counselor, school social worker. Um, there's also validated group approaches, um, CBITS for one, that can help the really seriously traumatized kid cope. But just general mindfulness-based activities, deep breathing, come to one of our workshops, Melissa will Melissa has a, a number of different strategies that um, she talks about that a general educator could deploy and make a regular part of their classroom experience. Rose? I appreciate, uh, Pia, you're, you're seeing the connection, and you know, Steve and I were, were discussing this a little bit before we started, um, in working with the communities that I've in, interacted with, dealing with historical trauma and recognizing it as we go out, we do presentations in Indian country and being told by my co-presenter, make sure we leave 10 minutes at the beginning, maybe even more to just leave, let people talk because as soon as you bring up the topic and, and people need to talk about how they've been impacted. Um, so that maybe only half of the presentation time is the content that we want to talk about. Uh, and so if we look at historical trauma and even looking at how when you have a curriculum that is validating, um, I'm reminded of, of a young woman that Mimi mentored, uh, went through the teacher ed program, Chelsea Gaynor, and I saw her present at UC Berkeley and I saw her present here at Sac State and seeing people watching her present and she's a blue-eyed, blonde-haired young lady and I saw their body posture suddenly change they soften, smiles come into their face, and they walk out with glee after hearing her presentation that was so affirming of their culture and their background and who they are. Um, and wouldn't that be wonderful if all children had that within our schools? Because then we do want to think that our schools are safe places, but then when you come from neighborhoods or homes that are not safe, uh, now it's compounded, right? right. Yeah. Right. Sasha. Well, just to follow up on Julian's idea, I think that sort of the economist would just take the data on primary and neighborhood and then overlay the data on achievement and social economic status. So if you can find neighborhoods that are relatively poor but more or less violent, mm -hmm. that might be a good enough proxy to actually improve and kind of estimate the weight of this question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Get the, you know, there are at least six, seven different theories explaining it, and you're right, you don't have an explanation. So there's the cultural capital theory, there is the uh, uh, exposure theory, there is the nutrition theory, all kinds of stuff. So I think if you could, I mean, I know it's not your area, but <coughs> if we could definitely show that no, the yeah. weight of this thing is that much, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the data searches are pretty accessible. I mean, it was it, would, it took me all of five minutes to get the crime statistics. Um, yeah, and then you have 
um, publicly available <coughs> achievement test data. So yeah, that's that's the good idea, Sasha. <laughs> I like that a lot. historical trauma and focusing more on historical and generational trauma, especially in certain um, Native American communities, we talk about that. And Rose did a presentation about how the trauma and how that impacted California Indians. But what about the studies that look at how they're impacted over time, over generations? Yes. As, as I understand it, um, there may be things that happen to our DNA even. Yes. And we may even be producing uh, negative impacts to our to our children. Mm -hmm. And um, have you looked into that? What's the, what is I've the latest? Just started. Oh, you just started. I've just yeah. started. Yeah. yeah. The some of the first um, inklings I've got were looked at um, Holocaust survivors. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, that's some, definitely something that I want to look more into epigenetics and its effect long term. Right. And if you combine that with a bad diet, that's been given to us by the federal yeah. government. Yeah. So now you have physical... Th these, are all, these are all great um, ideas. And again, part of what I'm hoping to do is to help educators understand right. what happened to you. Um, but that's only going to be part of it. Right. Mm -hmm. The other part is, okay, now what can we do to help yeah. you deal with it? Yeah, Pia. Yeah. Um, speaking of worry at all, I mean, I worry oh, there's such a sort of shiny penny, silver bullet, you know, mentality education, I worry that people will hear a part of what you're trying to say, um, which is your brain's been changed, and they won't hear the rest of what you're trying to say, which yeah. is, we actually, you know, it's not permanent, because um, I think we, the, the issues are so complex, and we constantly seek for sort of the easiest way, um, and sometimes the easiest way is just an explanation that, you know, gets them off the hook, right? Mm -hmm. How are you going to make sure your entire message is engaged by teachers? Good question. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> Sit them down and lock them in a room until you're, I mean, I think, um, I don't know, I think you just, you're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to get your message out there. Yeah. Um, I think it's important to get another different point, you know, sort of maybe work backwards from the strategies into the research and uh -huh. why. Um, I think sometimes people can't, can't start where? The very end. I'm not sure, but don't start at the. Oh, you're saying with the start with the message of oh, we can do something different. about it. <laughs> there are things that we can do, and then oh, that's an interesting point. Right. Yeah, I like that. Thank or you. videos of those things in practice, right? And yeah. What do you think is going on? Yeah, 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 yeah. Start with the oh. we can make a difference message, and then move yeah. into the other. Okay. Thanks. Do you guys want to hang out some more? These are great ideas. <laughs> My sabbatical doesn't start for a few weeks, and you know, I could get you all ready to go. I'm sorry. Is that another hand? Uh, Lisa? Mike's more sort of a comment, sort of trying to think through all this. So, I mean, I taught in San Bernardino County, and uh, actually we used to be gang in school. And, and yeah. so, you know, that, that's fundamentally different from, you know, an upper middle class neighborhood where, yeah, there's going to be some kids in every classroom that have abuse going on in their homes or fights in their school, whatever, right? So, in the upper middle class, it might be. like San Bernardino County, you're talking about a lot of the kids in the classroom have ongoing daily trauma in their homes and in their neighborhoods, right? And, and I don't know, I guess I'm just thinking, you know, so it's such a bigger job here. And then at the same time, I'm wondering about um, how some of this research plays out in terms of, I don't know, it just sounds like it's too easy of a fix. Well, we just know what to do. Why aren't we doing it? And how well, well, the research, how well the research really works on um, kids that are still 
daily in these conversations <coughs> as opposed to, okay, now it's here's a kid, you've gotten the battle, whatever the situation is, and now we're going to use the test on um, you know, cognitive right. behavioral therapy, right? Yeah. Versus cognitive behavioral therapy, but when you go home this afternoon and <laughs> everything's the same. Yeah. I don't know, that's just kind it, of and it, and it house, is, and it is important to appreciate that in certain environments, um, having a really active amygdala I mean, keeps you alive. Central every day. Nothing's right. Gonna, you know. So I guess what I'm trying to do, and you know, in 20 minutes, it's kind of hard to get too complex and too detailed. But what I'm trying to do is find ways to facilitate among educators understanding about complex trauma and its effects and how really the school presents in a number of different ways an amazingly potentially positive environment wherein we absolutely can make a difference. Um, we know for example treatment and compliance. We provide treatments at schools 21 times more likely to follow through on these treatments that we know that work. Um, I appreciate that for many of our nation's youth, school is not a safe experience. But arguably, objectively, if you want to look at the crime statistics, if you want your child to be safe, you know where you want them to be? In school. In a school. So I think what we need to do is find ways to realize that potential. No, I mean, I absolutely think these are schools teachers need, especially in certain schools in this year, right? And that's one. And by the way, I, mean, I have conversations with my colleagues in San Bernardino on a pretty regular basis. I just had a big group of them in a training I did last summer um, and spent a lot of time with that particular district. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah? So um, at the beginning of school, this is, um, so at the beginning of school, like there's a, uh, big assembly where our vice principal all he talks is about all he talks about is um, this that one percent of the whole uh, uh, the entire class is not going to be there by the end of the year um, is it possible to get their minds off of the one percent and try to help the other 99% to see that it's possible not to have anybody that everybody be yeah. there at the end. Yeah, I think that's a very, very important point. And what I would like to see all educators do is to be really, really consciously deliberate about finding ways to include children as opposed to exclude. Yeah, I, I know that 1% that your principal's talking about. I work a lot with them. And my goal always has been, what can we include them in? Uh, a practice that has been pretty much by everybody shown to be ineffective and counterproductive is suspension and expulsion. That, that's bad. It does nobody any good. And so um, I appreciate what you're saying. And my goal would be to help that principal find ways to include that 1% and something that will help address the concerns that might otherwise lead them to be, you know, not there at the end of the year. Good question. Right, I'm getting. <laughs> yes, you. <laughs> um, I was just saying that um, I think that along with the educators, the parents should be involved as well. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah, that, that it absolutely makes things more effective if you can get a whole community involved. Um, sometimes there's challenges with that, and one thing I would really like the educator to appreciate is that first and foremost, yes, if you can get the family <coughs> and the broader community involved, it's gonna make whatever it is you do so much more effective. But not to let that be a reason for not trying you know, to the extent the family is, for whatever reason, unavailable, or the community isn't supportive, we still have a lot of potential in those, in that school building to create a safe, nurturing environment that understands what happened to you and can make 
really significant change. Um, thank you. Uh, I guess I appreciate this very much, and I'd push you a little bit kind of along the lines of what Pia was saying about, um, I'm thinking about the sources of complex trauma, and it's easy to kind of simplify it and say, like, there's abuse in the home or there's violence on the streets. Um, but I think uh, for a lot of people that belong to different oppressed groups, just living in society is a source of complex trauma. So it's not necessarily a matter of like what happened to you, but what is happening to you and what will continue to happen to you. Um, and even therapy itself can be traumatizing for people who uh, belong to groups that aren't necessarily understood when therapies are developed or that sort of thing. So um, yeah, just kind of pushing on the framing a little bit. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Because that what happened to you when you frame it like that, what happened to you, then I would argue that you're putting it in your the second tier, not the third tier. It's, it's you know, the three mm. tiers of yeah. trauma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The three tiers of trauma that Oh you yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you Tolerable. say what happened to you, that's that few one time off. Mm -hmm. So I would argue that What's you happening? need to re frame your what you're saying here is what is happening to you. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'd love to keep going. It's been very helpful. Um, and again, this is this this is new for me. Um, so I definitely want to thank you all for your your thoughtful comments. Um, I have my contact information up here. Um, it's really easy. It's my last name at CSUS, and um, I would really appreciate to continue this dialogue with any and all of you as we move forward because your points are, are very, very helpful to me and I want to thank you very much for them. <laughs>